Thanks so much. And sorry, I guess I'm not used to um, Utah, Utah traffic yet. I, I left early, but obviously not early enough. Um, so yeah, I, I thought the thing to talk about today is obviously COVID since I arrived in Utah three months ago. I was hired in May and the Utah De Department of Health clearly said, oh, it's gonna be great, you can come in, you can get on top of all those things we've ignored for the yet last year and three months. It'll be great, you can take care of all those other public health issues we've not neglected. And of course I got here right when Delta arrived. So I have been the Utah State COVID epidemiologist. Um, but yeah, I thought it would be useful to start out first by talking about where we are now and then sort of going through what, what we're doing in terms of um, COVID. So you've all seen the epi curve millions of times. You, I'm sure you know that hump in the center. That's, that's last winter where we had really bad cases throughout the country, actually kind of throughout the world. Um, and you can see, unfortunately, the end of the graph is now. And you can see the hump now is smaller than winter, but it's concerning. And we are having these trends in COVID that are um, it, really concerning. The last few days, um, about three weeks ago, we sort of hit a semi-peak. And um, for a few days, you've probably heard us saying, oh, we're maybe declining. Unfortunately, today's numbers were making us back into plateau. But it does look like we might be plateauing, unfortunately, a fairly high plateau. When you look at our numbers right now, we're plateauing where we're getting over 1,000 cases a day. And that's certainly not what we would like to plateau at. So there is definitely real issues going on, even while we're this far into the pandemic. Um, and so when you, one thing to consider when we're looking at all these trends is we can only detect what we test, right? So we have to consider what are our testing trends to really interpret what our case trends are. The thing that is reassuring is actually recently people have been getting a lot of tests. You can see on the end of the graph, we have quite high bars there. So people are testing quite a lot. It's gone down a little bit in the last few weeks. Um, and with that, we've also seen an increased positivity. So we're actually hanging around 15% of people who get tested are positive. That's actually considered very high. Um, and it indicates to us that we're actually missing quite a lot of cases in the community. Most places, we, it, it's generally thought that we should aim for more about a 4% positivity to really be capturing most of the cases and really have the spread under control. So the graph that I just showed you back here, looks kind of good, but you had to take it with a grain of salt that we are missing a fair amount of our cases, which means that we are not getting to the end of this yet. Um, and one thing that, that I thought was interesting is looking at our cases by age. This, um, unfortunately, the numbers look, I don't know if on yours they're cut off, no, on mine they're cut off, um, and they're also very small, but this, each, each colored line is a different age group. The thing I want you to have overall look like is they generally have followed a very similar pattern, right? But one thing that was very interesting is if we pull out this blue, brown line right here, you can see it looks like it's following everybody else, and then about a month ago, it had this big incline that wasn't seen in any other age groups. That's our school-age children. And that's when school started. So you can see very clearly that we are seeing an impact of kids going back to school, um, that that age group specifically is having the increase in cases. So, okay, cases are one thing. If everybody was just staying home with the sniffles, nobody really cares, but what is the impact of all these cases? Well, we know it's impacting our hospitals quite significantly. Probably all of you can tell me this in your real life. Um, I hear it numbers every day. Um, but we are seeing huge numbers of hospitalization and ICU utilization. And I think what's imp impressive here is that graph I showed you, the, the epi curve, the, the Cases over the winter were a lot higher than where we are now. We're high, but we're not as high. If you look at this hospitalization chart, we're really the same as we were in the winter. So we're having the same kind of hospitalization numbers we were in the winter time, and our ICUs are being used just as much. Um, there we go. So as probably many of you know, we have a certain amount of capacity in Utah, and most of our capacity is here along the Wasatch Front. Um, overall, we have uh, 531 ICU beds across all of Utah. Um, some of those are in smaller hospitals, about 78 of them are in smaller hospitals, and then 453, so most of them are in our big referral hospitals. Um, and right now we're seeing challenges 
actually throughout this whole system. Um, we're seeing definite um, hospital staff shortages. We're hearing over and over again how hard it is to get nursing to stay, respiratory therapists, even physicians have been really burnt out by this whole um, pandemic. Um, and then we are seeing our usual summer trauma because summer is when people go out and rock climb and mountain bike and we get traumas from that. And we're seeing that on top of our COVID. And also we're seeing some delayed care from 2020. We know people were avoiding going to care, so that also is flooding our system. Um, and we are seeing all these cases partially because we're having the Delta variant, but also because we, haven't, we don't have the controls that we had last year in terms of protections. Um, and we also are getting, states around us are getting hit hard. And we usually are a referral center for all these different states that have less capacity from us. So we're used to here in Utah taking people from other states when their hospitals are overwhelmed and putting them in our hospitals. That's one of the things we're proud of here. And right now we aren't able to do that because we're actually having a really hard time taking care of our own patients. Um, so we get direct reports from the four largest hospitals every day at the Department of Health and we get this as a readout because it's kind of misleading to look at bed numbers because a bed without a nurse and a doctor is pretty useless. And we know that the staffing shortage is actually a bigger problem than the bed shortage. So if we're looking at staffed beds, um, this was, I do, I, this was October 4th, so what was that, two days ago? Um, the four hospitals told us of their ICUs, three of them are, well, one of them's over 100%, two are 100%, and one is 89% of their ICUs are full. That is crazy. We never have been here before. And then acute care beds, you can see one is 100%. We have two in the 80s and 195. This is really concerning. This shows how stressed our healthcare system is. Um, and two of the hospitals specifically pointed out their staff shortages. Um, and also important to consider is this diversion. So we know we have small hospitals that don't have the capacity or the abilities to, um, to treat people with severe severe illness. And so we're used to moving patients between small hospitals to big hospitals to get them appropriate care. So we've had 434 ICU diversions um, during September. Um, if you look at how this compares, at the beginning, the first week of September, we had 76 patients needing transferred. At the end, we had 114. So almost double. Uh, no, not quite double. Sorry. Little, little under double. Um, and then the other thing that's important is it's taking us a really long time to get people beds. Usually these things happen very fast. Our system's actually well set up to find a patient who needs something and figure out where to put them. Beginning of the month of uh, September, we had 80 minute wait times. At the end of the month, we had 225 minute wait times. So you can imagine this has a very bad impact on patient outcome. Um, this, is, this is not what we want to be doing as a as a good healthcare system. Um, and I'm sure all of you were aware that Idaho declared this crisis standard of care back in September. That is an, um, I, I, I can't imagine, I, I never would have imagined we would have gotten to this, but it's really terrible that Idaho had to go there and we really don't want to go there. But the truth is, is we are not far off here in Utah. Um, so we've sort of laid out what is normal standard of care, which I don't think I need to review anybody. But then we went to contingency care, and then there's this whole thing called crisis standard of care, which is actually a governmental um, mandate or a de declaration. Um, and at first we had these three layers, and then we realized we sort of needed to divide crisis or contingency care into different levels because it turns out we are far, far into contingency care. And in many ways, we are doing crisis standards of care here in Utah. We're doing bed, um, we're, we're doing room splitting where we have people double bunking in the same bed. We have nurses taking care of more patients than um, is appropriate. We have uh, primary care physicians doing advanced care in the medical settings. So we actually are in what would be considered the deepest contingency of contingency care. And we're really just a few hairs away from the crisis standard of care, which I, I, I think is some places really are aware of this. It's very apparent when you're in the big tertiary care hospitals that this is happening. Other places it's, it's removed. I think in the general community, people still don't understand how much of a stress our hospital systems are doing right now because life feels pretty normal. Um, but the truth is, 
what we're hearing, and this has been for at least three weeks that we've been at this level, that our hospitals are just at their, at and a little bit beyond their regular capacity, or their capacity. Um, and, and mostly what I just told you all there was about um, adult hospitals, because there's no question, COVID hits adults much harder than it hits peds. Um, but it, interestingly, we do actually have a, a number of, uh, we have a problem in the pediatric hospitals. So you can see here, um, we have, if we have, um, if we, we can see how many kids get affected. And we see that there are still a fair bit of numbers. Um, if we look at hospitalization, the numbers drop a lot. So kids rarely need to get hospitalized for this. Thank goodness. But it turns out um, our pediatric hospital capacity is also exceptionally stressed. Of course, our pediatric capacity is much smaller. There's only a few um, pediatric specialty hospitals in the state and only a, f a smaller number of pediatric beds. But you can see here, we are quite stressed. And this is actually yesterday's numbers. Today's numbers are worse. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but they're worse. So 91% of all inpatient beds are filled and 82% of pediatric ICU beds are filled. So we are quite full in pediatrics. So you have to question like, okay, I just told you, COVID doesn't hit kids that hard. And the truth is, most of these kids in the inpatient beds are not pediatric, are, are not COVID cases. So what is happening? Well, we actually have other things going on such as it's just outdoors activity for kids, but we also have a really weird RSV season. Um, so you can see all those dotted lines, that's our usual RSV peak. Usually we get RSV in the winter, that's what we've always seen. You can see the red dotted line, or the red dotted line, that's last year. It flat lines, right? We did, we skipped COVID last, or we skipped RSV last year. It's, it's pretty impressive. But unfortunately, the green line that's way over on the edge of the graph where we're not looking is this year. And what we're seeing is RSV coming out of season in our community. So we actually have a lot of RSV hospitalizations right now in the pa pediatric units. Um, we could have a long discussion about exactly what this means. It's actually really interesting. It, clearly, we protected our children last year by all wearing masks and doing good respiratory care, and we avoided our RSV. But it's I don't know if anybody expected to just have a wave in the summer because of the lack of the wave in the winter, but we do. Um, and so this is a large part of what's happening. And actually, we're seeing a lot of different respiratory illnesses come into the little kids um, that's causing our pediatric hospitals to be stressed. So COVID, maybe not directly, but it's obviously a factor here of what is messing with all of these um, diseases right now. Um, and then, of course, death. So biggest impact we're worried about is people uh, passing away. So this is our, um, our curve of deaths over time. You can see, unfortunately, our, our, our numbers recently are not that different than what we saw over the big, um, the big wave in the winter. And overall, we can say we've had 2,962 Utahns die, which is really, really tragic from this whole, um, out this whole pandemic. So, okay, that's all the bad news, so what can we do, right? So I'm gonna say the thing about masks because there's been so much debate about masks and I have to admit, the mask data in general is terrible, right? Because most of the mask data was just showing, oh look, everybody's wearing masks, we have less disease. And it, most of the data didn't have any comparison and it's impossible to show something successful unless you can compare it to the lack of it, right? And until recently, there were very few publications that could show that. But most recently, we have had some publications that do this. Um, one is from the uh, St. Louis University. They looked at uh, cases who were identified with COVID. They looked at all their contacts, and they were able to very well trace all these, or um, monitor all these contacts for COVID. And they interviewed both sides to see whether or not the case and the contact were masked when the exposure occurred. And they found that if the, the contacts in the case were masked, if they're masking, those were people were one fifth as uh, likely to get COVID as the when the case and the contact were unmasked. So five times more likely to get COVID if you're unmasked. That's that's nice data. I actually really like that data. Um, and then the other study that came out recently was using Arizona School. It was around Tucson. 
or no, yeah, it was around Tucson. Um, and they have different schools that are doing different masking approaches. And they had some schools that from the very beginning of school, they put in mask mandates and other schools that chose not to. And they looked at outbreaks in those schools to see how different the outbreaks were, whether it was masked or not. And they found that um, schools that didn't have any masks were three and a half times more likely to have an outbreak than the schools that did have masks. I like that study too. Those are both kind of studies that make me feel like, okay, there's good data. Um, and then I think the other one I want to mention is this Bangladesh study, because I think it's been said in a lot of places. For some reason, it got a lot of hype. Um, this study was actually made to look at the impact of education on mask wearing. It wasn't made to look at mask wearing on your infection. So when people talk about this study, they're slightly misinterpreting the results. Um, instead, they, what it really showed is that if they went and really intervened in the community, they could get mask wearing to increase um, up to 42%. And when they then went and looked at serology in the community that had a little bit more mask wearing to the community that had a little less mask wearing because they didn't do an intervention, they couldn't see a huge difference. But this study was looking at serology, and it wasn't about all mask versus no mask. It was like medium mask to low medium mask. So this study really wasn't about looking at mask mandates or mask effects. So when people bring up the Bangladesh study, be skeptical. So I do think there's two good studies so far that really um, support the idea that masks can have an impact. There's also a lot of studies about just when they do um, physical measurements about if they release uh, particulate in a room, if you're wearing the different kinds of masks, how much goes through, that stuff is very strong and very well established. But I'm sure now that there's so much differential mask wearing in um, our communities, we'll get some more studies that will really tell us how much these work and maybe even which kinds work um, well. So of course then vaccination, what, what can we do? Biggest one is vaccination. Um, and this is our, uh, our curves here in Utah for both cases and hospitalizations. Um, the orange line is all the unvaccinated people. You can see our classic trend. The green lines just start appearing around May, and those are our vaccinated people who get breakthrough infections. And so what you can see is we have amazingly good blunting of these infections in that population. And um, so these are case rates. So you, they are corrected for how many people are in each population. So even though there's, um, in the beginning, there were very, very few people vaccinated, the rate is corrected. Um, but what you can, yeah, it, it's impressive that these, these vaccines are really keeping people from getting infected, and then more importantly, get, get keeping them from going and being hospitalized. Um, but that's, that's sort of a pictorial way. I think it's nice to look at it as numbers. Um, so if we take 100,000 uh, unvaccinated Utahns and we take 100,000 vaccinated Utahns and we look at what happened to those people since February, we can find in the unvaccinated group that there were 126,000 cases versus in the vaccinated group there were 18,000. That means there were four times more cases in the unvaccinated group than the vaccinated group. If we take that same group, we look at hospitalizations, there's 7,640 in the unvaccinated, 962 in the vaccinated. That means eight times more likely to be hospitalized. And then the deaths is 836 versus 124, which is 10 times more likely. So, or almost 10 times. Um, I like those odds. <laughs> I, 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 those are not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect vaccine. But these vaccines are doing actually exceptionally well. This is what we want. We want to protect against hospitalization and death. And it is these vaccines are doing exceptionally well. Right. Fully, vaccinated. fully vaccinated. Yep. So we have how many people vaccinated in the state? There's there's thousand or. I, I should know hundreds of thousands. Um, so this is not unexpected. If, if you go on our Utah State website, it breaks it down by age group. And unfortunately, in that, you can start to see what it is, is the people who are high risk of death are still the people. The vac we know older people don't respond to vaccines so well, right? Even with influenza vaccine, we've always give high dose or a higher dose influenza vaccine to the elder population. So it's quite likely, and that's what the booster doses recommendation is, is those people need more vaccine because the breakthrough infections that go on to, to fatality are those who are older and those who have significant underlying conditions. This is all COVID, yes. Help my math 
year. If we look at 100,000 unvaccinated Utahns, we have 120,000. Oh, you're right. That's interesting. Cases. So it must be a million. You're right. I will, I will pull, okay, I will correct the numbers. I'm yeah. sorry. But the ratios, so the ratios are wrong. The ratios are correct. Um, so the unvaccinated population is the same size as the vaccinated population. Um, and the, so the ratios are correct. My 100,000 at the beginning is incorrect. You're right. Yeah. So it's obvious that vaccines really protect people. But the thing that's scary is why aren't they having more of an effect on the pandemic? Ah, it's well, we'll get there. Look at like Israel. Yep. So we'll get there. Um, so. What does this do? I think there's some other interesting uh, thing, ways to look at this. One is long-term care facilities. As you all know, long-term care facilities is where we see the worst cases and we've had the most, well, the highest proportion of deaths. So this is, I think, a really nice graphic where this is cases in long-term care facilities um, by day. And you can see the red is our first round of getting in the vaccine. You can see purple is when Delta appears. So you can see we put in that vaccine and we drop really fast. And that's actually a lot faster than what we saw in the general community. Delta appeared, we actually had pretty good protection for a while after Delta, but unfortunately we're getting through those leak through. Um, and which is where the booster, booster recommendations from CDC and FDA are coming from. That people with significant, immune, uh, significant um, medical conditions are needing that booster. Um, and it does, it, it, the Israel data really supports that once you get a booster in this population, they get back up into their protection. Um, oops, wrong button. And then, okay, herd immunity, can we get there? So this is actually data from Utah. You can look, there's data from US that's actually very similar to this. Along the x-axis, we go along, we get more and more people vaccinated. As we go up the y-axis, we have more and more cases. And this is our data for the last 14 days. What you can see is we have a slope there, right? So more vaccinated, less cases, less vaccinated, more cases. And this is, this is true in Utah, as we see here, but this is true throughout the country. They can do this on the county level and see the same trends. Um, and so we are seeing that there is definitely a relationship between vaccine levels and um, breakthrough ca or, and cases overall. So this is the idea of both herd immunity and just that you have more people protected. Um, unfortunately, there is still huge disparities. I'm sure a lot of you have seen data showing that we do have um, uh, disparities both in the cases and the vaccinated population. So here I've shown what Utah has in terms of the percent of the population um, of different ethnic populations who are vaccinated. Unfortunately, we have a pretty big disparity here. We go from 33% in our American Indian Alaska Native population to 60% in our white non-Hispanic population. We need to get those all much higher. But what makes this really sad is when you look at our cases, um, and the mortality, we have unfortunately our two most uh, populations that have been most affected are also in our top, our lowest three vaccine groups. So unfortunately, we, the people who are being hard hit, we're not getting vaccine into those communities. And the Department of Health is really trying to figure out ways to encourage trust, encourage um, some relationships to get uptake better into these minority populations to make sure we can drop their rates as well. Um, so I, I thought as physicians, as a clinical group, um, it would be specifically of interest to all of you about what adverse events or side effects come from these vaccines. Because I know I get questions about this all the time, and I assume you do as well. So I looked at the data just last night, or the night before, um, and from CDC to see what they're detecting. So as you, as you know, VAERS is the required reporting system that any adverse event um, thought to be related to a vaccine is required to be reported in by a provider. And vSAFE is what we all get those little texts about to ask if we're doing okay. Um, so anaphylaxis, big one that we were all told about at the beginning that we were gonna be worried about for these mRNAs. Turns out it's actually quite rare. Um, they've had two to five people per million vaccines given appear to have anaphylaxis. And that one is looking very stable and also very treatable. So that's better than we ever thought it was gonna be. Um, myocarditis and pericarditis, you have certainly heard about this. Um, as of September 22nd, VAERS had received 1,500 reports. Um, 
And this is, you have to consider, there's 390 million doses of the vaccine given. So 1,500 might seem like a lot, but we're talking about the entire US. So this is a very small number. Um, and CDC and the FDA have confirmed some of these um, so that we know they are variable um, myocarditis and pericarditis. The, the people who most often have this adverse event are male adolescents and in general young adults. And it's usually after the second dose and several days after the vaccination. And the, this, um, this side effect is specifically seen in those with, uh, who receive the mRNA vaccine. And uh, they don't go into that detail, sorry. Um, and the thing that has been remarked in a number of publications, both case reports and studies, is that these cases tend to respond very well and actually better than most cases of other etiologies of myocarditis or pericarditis. So generally very rare and quite treatable. Um, and then Guillain-Barre, as you know, Guillain-Barre we see with a number of different vaccines. Um, as, as of September 22nd, we, VAERS has only gotten 210 reports, so that is exceptionally small number. Um, it's the ones when they see it, it seems to be those people who got J&J &J two weeks after vaccination, and specifically men who are older. Um, so exceptionally rare, if even linked truly to the vaccine, because we have to remember there's going to be these events that occur in the absence of vaccine when you have the entire population. So CDC hasn't specifically said whether or not they feel this is related, they're just reporting the number. So 210, what do we expect from a baseline population? I don't know, I think they're probably looking into that. Um, and then the other ones is thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome. Um, there have been 47 cases uh, confirmed with J&J. &J. This is the one that caused the pause. Uh, specifically women uh, younger than 50 years of age and more even specifically women generally of childbearing age. Um, they have shown two confirmed cases with an mRNA vaccine, but that is thought to be just what's expected in a population size. So the, MR the Moderna ones are thought to be random chance. The 47 with J&J &J is possibly more causative. Um, and then related to deaths, which I think everybody always asks, how many people have died from the COVID vaccine? So of the 390 million doses, we have had 8,164 reports of death. So that's less than, well, that's 0.002%. Um, and the thing to remember is that FDA requires all deaths after a vaccine to be reported. So that means any death after a vaccine to be reported. And so this is a lot of deaths that are not going to be related to the vaccine. Um, and, and it's then the job of CDC, FDA, and others to go through, review all those deaths and see which ones are causally, are thought to be causally related. Um, and so that number is the max and probably ex extreme overestimation, right? Because if I died right now, I got vaccinated nine months ago, they theoretically still need to report me because I'm someone who got, died after vaccination. Though I don't think that happens that often. Um, so in sub-study conducted in May, uh, they found out of the of, of 28 cases of thrombocytopenia, um, they thought three of them were more likely to be causally related. So I do think there is data suggesting that there is a true risk of thrombocytopenia um, syndrome in young uh, women and those who get J&J, &J, and this is possibly the cause of a few deaths. But I will report, it, it, it repeat, a few deaths. I think the thing overall that I take away from all of this is it's actually kind of convenient. We have one vaccine, the mRNAs that are a little bit more risky for myocarditis, pericarditis in young men. We have J&J &J that's definitely more risky for young women. And so there is, in a way, options to consider. If you have a person with specific risk factors, you could choose a different vaccine. So overall, these vaccines are exceptionally safe um, and they are doing very well. But it's something to consider. I personally would choose not to take J&J. &J, um, and I think it's, it's appropriate to, to have that in mind. Um, and then monoclonal antibodies uh, is our next step in sort of the approach to what we can do. 
Um, there, these are a two-hour infusion. There is an option that's starting to um, be available for sub-Q uh, delivery, um, but these are uh, monoclonal antibodies laboratory produced against the spike protein. Um, here in Utah, we're doing really targeted treatment because we know that um, there, that most people don't need hospitalization. These, these medications are fairly significant, and therefore we want to target them to the people who can benefit from, from them most. I have listed there, there's a risk calculator we actually just put up on the Utah Department of Health website two days ago, or maybe today even, um, where you can go in and you can put in um, the characteristics of the individual and see whether or not they're rec recommended to get monoclonal therapy. Um, and it's a kind of fun to see whether or not you would too. Um, but I, I highly recommend that is if you see people who recently tested positive, help them go and look at this and see if they would benefit from monoclonal therapy because there is definitely a population that will be helped by this. Um, so just as an example, so we had to get, you had to get to a certain risk score, but the risk score is actually not super stringent. So all these people that are listed here would qualify. So a man over 72, a black female over 54, a male 31 who has diabetes. You can see there's a large part of our population who's going to fall into this. So yeah, I would I suggest that you go look at that so that if you see people who recently test positive, you can know whether or not they could, they could benefit from this. Um, so we have currently two treatments here in, in Utah. I'm not going to even try to say those names. Um, there is a third that's about to be distributed. Um, and based on the criteria that we're using, so those risk factors, we estimate that approximately we need to treat 20 people to prevent one hospitalization, which right now we think that's, that's the, a reasonable ratio. If we loosen it up and give it to more people, we would dramatically change that ratio to the point where it's just not useful. Um, the, in Utah, we provided about 500 treatments last week. We are ramping up our treatment ability, um, and there is a link there, or the our website there has links to the locations around the state. And there are a number of uh, locations every, uh, pretty much distributed across the state. Oops. Um, and we are doing a few that are these um, sort of uh, set up sites. We have one that's um, going up in Murray. Um, these can do quite a few infusions every day. We just, it, it, you need other staff, but in terms of the actual infusion staff, we need either two RNs or three medics to infuse 10, 50 people a day. So these are sites that we can do a lot of fusions really fast. Um, and so we have that one in Murray. We're hoping to put up another one uh, more into the south in a little, little while. Um, and then the other treatments I get asked about, such as ivermectin, yes. okay. Just monoclonal antibodies. Uh, just to, to first off, pregnancy is an automatic inclusion, which you didn't put up there. I, I, Am I wrong on that? A pregnancy is not a inclusion criteria. It, no, it's an automatic inclusion criteria in the state of Utah. Yeah, I, this wasn't the list. It was just examples of people. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And then um, I, I work in an unaffiliated. I'm not. My clinic is not affiliated with any of the large uh, healthcare providers in the state. So we have patients that probably qualify. Is there a state clearinghouse where I can send a referral to, or do I have to work with these other healthcare agencies? No, so I would recommend you go to the list that's on this, um, on this website. I have, I, mean, I, I just want to make it easy. Yeah, we're trying to set up a call line to do this. Um, it, it's really hard to get it going. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have tried to hire people recently. It is impossible. Even to answer phones, we are having a horrible time. But so the website is the best way to go right now, um, but we are trying to set up a hotline. So now you ruined my like punchline here is that I get calls on a lot of other treatments uh, such as ivermectin, hydrochloricine, and nebulized hydrogen peroxide. And I can strongly say that none of those are treatment. I, I am terrified to think of what happens to somebody who nebulizes hydrogen peroxide, but unfortunately it is happening here in Utah. We've had people who have been <laughs> found unconscious because they overdosed on ivermectin um, and had to be hospitalized for multiple days. We've had the, the, um, the poison control line be called for all these types of um, medications. We had ICU admission for someone who nebulized hydrogen peroxide. Unfortunately, these things are online and have some followers. And, and, and it appears we occasionally have some physicians who actually do provide this, which I think is, is we really need to get education out about that these have been proven not to work. 
Um, and then the one new treatment that hopefully is going to get to us sometime in the coming months is this uh, antiviral that Merck just announced about a week ago. Um, the data that they are putting in their FDA application on is about 775 adults where they did a placebo-controlled study. Um, and they were able to, as long as the criteria is that the person had to have um, be within five days of their onset of symptoms, and they were able to half the hospitalization rate and the death rate in this population. They were fairly selective about who they included, so it had to be people high risk. Um, but so this, this is a promising medication. We'll see what comes out with the rest of the data um, and see how FDA reacts to it. But certainly if that comes out, it's a take-home uh, pill. So we don't need to admit people. We don't have the complexity of having con lines. So if this, if this comes out and looks good, it's going to help us a lot in the coming months. Yeah, we've had conversations about is that concerning for vaccine. Um, there's so many things about what's going <laughs> to I, I, it's, it's kind of amusing when you look at this. The study was on 775 people. So if people decide to trust this more than the vaccines, which were about 20,000 on each clinical trial, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, there's no question. One is preventative medicine. One is rescue medicine, right? So we're certainly going to continue to encourage people to vaccinate, but there is. You're right. I think monoclonals even were worried that people are feeling like, oh, there's a backup. I don't need to get vaccine, which really isn't appropriate because the backup only works half the time. Um, and that's true for this, right? 50% uh, rate. So the backup is not a great backup. Okay, so quickly, what are we getting for the next surge as well? We are ready for our vaccines. Um, five, I should say five to 11 year olds. Hopefully, I, I think we all hear the rumors, Thanksgiving, Halloween, which, whichever way we're getting our system set up so that we can hopefully get it out quickly. Um, at home testing, I think is gonna change a lot of this and um, will make it so we can't make those pretty graphs about who's getting affected every day, but um, it will be, I think, much more successful to be able to get people quickly out of community settings and encourage them to stay home. Um, and then what are we gonna do? Are we gonna, is this gonna become an endemic where we get an endemic winter pattern or what are we doing? And one of the way we're trying to set up to be ready for that is we have wastewater monitoring systems. We've already been using those for multiple months, but the idea is that's something, while we're at this high rate, it's not really useful to monitor the wastewater. We know there's COVID in the wastewater right now. Um, but as it becomes less, um, less prevalent, it's going to be useful that we could have sort of this early signal when we start to see COVID in the wastewater. We'll be able to say, ah, this community has an increase in COVID and we'll be able to sort of uh, target message, target um, test in those areas. So we have that in place for when things get a little lower. And influenza, as we know, we skipped influenza last year, so we have suspicions this year will be bad because nobody's wearing a mask and we're all a little more susceptible. And then new variants, who knows? <laughs> Let's hope they, the virus is not smarter than us. Um, so with that, uh, I'm, I'll quit and be happy to take call to questions. Um, it's a heck of a lot of slides ago, but the um, cases in the, school, the primary school age children, mm -hmm. To me, those spikes looked very similar last year to this year. Yeah, it's Can actually... Can you comment on that? Because I know I've got a five and a six-year-old this year, and I've tried to encourage both of them to mask. Yeah. And I have become well aware of the fact that my six-year-old can tell me to go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're right. And, and unfortunately, I didn't pull out the kid graph specifically for this, um, this group. But what I will say is what we see is they all go up pretty rapidly, right? Um, but when you compare it to the peaks last year, and you're not going to like this, but when you compare it to the peaks last year, the, um, the teenagers, their peak last year, if it was here, their peak right now is like here. So they're much below where they were last year. If you take the five to 10 years old, the peak year last year was here, and the peak right now is here. Yeah, so so the, did the school masking actually not help? 
because they were all doing this all the time or whatever. Well, okay, that's, so so that's the that's the little nugget I'm trying to tease out right. here. Right. Okay. So I would say well, the, I'm going to say what I said. What, what I was showing is that vaccines working, right? Because we're getting yeah. the the yeah. teens, we're dropping their rates. Um, what we can say is the masking. We you know test to stay, right? We're already getting triggers for test to stay much earlier at higher rates than we saw last year. Now, can we say it's mask? Can we say it's delta? It's it's confounded, right? There's a lot of things going on right now because masks definitely. Are what we're taking away from a lot of schools, um, but Delta also was introduced. So there is two different games happening at the ha same time. Um, I can say that I, I know I didn't arrive, I wasn't here yet, but last year when the governor released schools from mass mandates, it was about two weeks before the end of school. That's when we had our biggest outbreaks in schools. So after ki kids were allowed to go to do events without masks, that's when we had our big outbreaks. Yes, I've heard it said that uh, we will probably not reach herd immunity. Would you comment on that, please? Yeah, there's been so much debate about it. Um, I really hope we do, because <laughs> I want to get back to regular life. Um, I, I personally, and this is my hypothesis, so you can all have your own, I think the reason why we get hit so hard, right, is because none of us were immune. And so therefore, we have just tons of super susceptible, susceptible people all all walk, being together. Even if we don't get the, it depends on what you define herd immunity. Do I think we might not get herd immunity for like a case? I think that's quite possible, but we still might have a increased protection of what we had when we were all totally naive. So while we might still have cases, we might not get as significantly ill if we're vaccinated, if we had a previous infection. So I think that is what I'm hoping for, is that even if we continue to see transmission and cases, we will not see the severe impacts of them. What, what do we know about natural immunity and our ways to test that? Yeah, so there's been a number of publications recently. Um, Israel, somebody mentioned Israel. Israel has amazing data sets. I wish I was an epidemiologist in Israel. Um, they, partially because they just track everyone, right? So they can figure out what everyone ate for breakfast and whether or not they had COVID. Um, so Israel has really good data. There's been a number of places that looked at um, natural immunity and how that affects infection. So I prefer to look at whether or not natural immunity affects whether or not you get diagnosed versus whether or not you have antibodies because they might not completely be the same, right? So um, there's been a number of studies that show that natural immunity is fairly protective. And I think I'm fairly convinced um, there's probably, I'd say, six or seven good publications that look at um, the ratio of uh, infections in people who are previously infected versus the general population. And sometimes they compare it to the vaccinated population. I'd say there, the vaccine and the previous, immune, previous infection are pretty similar. I will also say there's good data showing that they're additive. So even those people who had a previous infection, giving them a vaccine bumps them up a whole nother level. Um, so I do think there is pretty good evidence of uh, protection with natural immunity, but I will caveat that with, I don't think any of these studies go beyond people who were infected about six months ago. So we still don't know what's gonna go on and on and on with that people who were infected previously. Right now, I think it's, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable saying people who are infected about six months ago are, are fairly protected, but I still would give them a vaccine because get that next level. Do we know what percent of people who are vaccinated had a prior infection? Um, we, we don't. We are actually trying to get that to work in our databases right now. Um, right now, our databases, if you're a case, we look to see whether you're not a vaccinated. But if you are a pace, case months ago, we don't see if you get vaccinated in the future. We will be able to do that probably around the end of the month. How well do you think the cloth mask works? Because if they don't work very well, we need to get the word out, get people wearing proper masks. And then the second question I have is, how many doses of messenger RNA vaccine for people that have been infected? Um, so for cloth masks, I agree that there's a, there's a tier system, right? Like cloth, surgical, my KN95, and then an N95. Um, I agree, because you, you generally breathe around your cloth mask. I do think, though, I mean, the studies that I cited, the one in the school and, well, the one in the university and one in Arizona schools, those were cloth masks. 
So they do do something. I think all these things are small additives. Vaccines, the big, but small additives of small fab helping with Fabi Max helps a little bit. The other ones help a lot more. There's no question. So correlation isn't causation. But these were studies that were done where they looked at the relationship. So yeah. Uh, second, oh, how many doses? Oh, how many doses? Um, I think the recommendation is still two. Um, Right now, we have enough vaccine in the state that I don't know why I wouldn't give to. Well, the third, you know, only the third is well, the the third, the third is, is six months later, right? So, a, th a third is either six months later or somebody who's immunocompromised. We're going to control the pandemic. We've got to get the whole world vaccinated. You can't be throwing away vaccines. I agree, but I don't think us using a few extra doses is the problem right now. Yeah. Real quick, I saw a study out of. Great Britain, where they're actually uh, administering two vaccine types. Have you looked into that at all? I haven't. I know that's up for FDA review. There's actually some studies looking at it. They're supposed to review it next week. Um, I'll be interested to see what the data is. I've seen some data that looks like actually it, it does very well. There's very minimal side effects. I suspect there'll be no issue about mixing them. It will be interesting to see if you sort of get a little extra protection because you have two slightly different things. But I will see what the full data shows. Is there a way to study people who have obviously been exposed but do not contract the virus to see what they have genetically or immunity-wise, why they are resistant? Yeah. Um, I know there's been a number of studies looking at people who get hospitalized and have found a few genetic markers. Um, I, I had to say that's beyond the, uni that the Utah Department of Health. I think that's more like an academic study that we should ask our university partners if they're interested in something is, like that. Is anyone doing that? I, I certainly don't know, but. How are they documenting these second infections? I mean, they're not getting genetic sequencing, so how can they be really be sure? I mean, a lot of people are positive for months. Yeah, so we've, we have a number of studies that have looked at people who are prolonged shutters, and it shows that people who, after 90 days, it is exceptionally rare to be a prolonged shutter. Um, and this is people who have been sequentially tested, so they can show positive, positive, negative, 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 and then see how long they go. Um, and there have been a few where they've been able to look at the genetics of the virus to show that it is a new virus. So I think the general consensus is 90 days is when we don't think it's anything new, or when we think it's still the old infection. After 90 days, it is thought to be a new infection. Um, and I can say a lot of these people who get reinfected um, are symptomatic. <laughs> so that's a big one. If you're symptomatic and you're positive, we feel pretty confident about that. And looking at the state database, um, we can see that we have a number of reinfections uh, documented. We, we at first ex suspected that we were undercounting it because probably a lot of people, once they've had COVID, either they don't think they have COVID again, so they don't go get tested, or they know what happens if they get diagnosed and they have to get the isolation. Um, so we think a lot of people don't get tested if they have a second infection. So we think we're missing a lot of our second infections. And we just uh, realized that when we look at our data that 14% of our reinfections get hospitalized, which either means your reinfection, you're a lot sicker because only about 1% to 3% of people get hospitalized in regular infection. Um, so either you get a lot sicker on your reinfection or we're missing a large amount of people who are getting reinfected, which is, I think, what I think it is. So we know there is symptomatic reinfection for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I think that it's, it's difficult to get the media to get attention right now. Um, we burnt out the media in the first eight months. Um, so media attention is hard. There is a lot of conflicting messaging about what, what we can put out. So.